Hi, this is Lou Guerrero with KBKG. I will be the moderator for today's presentation of our webinar, Opportunity Zone Deals, Separating Fact from Fiction. Joining us today will be three distinguished shareholders from the law firm of Greenberg and Tarig. First, a little bit about our firm. We are a specialty tax and consulting firm providing solutions to tax profession, professionals and business owners. Established in 1999, KBKG has served thousands of clients nationwide with a variety of narrow tax credits and incentive opportunities, including many real estate related products like cost segregation, green building tax incentives, repair and maintenance reviews, fixed asset reviews, partial dispositions, and related changes in accounting method. Uh, accounting methods. We have also helped clients with uh, research and development tax credits, IC DISC, and employ employment tax credits, uh, and, and many other uh, um, tax matters. As I mentioned, joining us today is uh, the experts from Greenberg Tar Tarig, and uh, we have three distinguished shareholders. They're an international uh, law firm established in 1967. Greenberg now has over 2,000 attorneys and 39 offices in the United States. Uh, they have a focus in real estate, um, including uh, acquisitions and finance, uh, and that's one of the cornerstones of their practice. They're heavily involved in funding structure, working with small, mid-size, and large-cap clients on a wide variety of real estate ventures and projects. Projects. Most importantly for today's topic, they are experts in uh, opportunity zones, uh, and they bring a systematic and innovative strategies uh, to uh, to this area of tax law. As I mentioned, my name is Lou Guerrero. I am uh, the tax practice leader and senior principal and shareholder at KBKG. And our panel today includes uh, the three shareholders: Ryan Bailing. Uh, Jim Lang and Sandy Present. With that, I will turn over the presentation to Ryan, who will introduce himself and his colleagues. Thank you, Lou. A uh, pleasure for everyone to be tuning in this afternoon. Hopefully, we make this a, a worthwhile and um, enlightening uh, educational experience. Um, my name's Ryan Bayline. I'm a shareholder with Greenberg based in Miami, Florida. Uh, I focus on real estate development and finance. Uh, with us, uh, we have Jim Lang, who heads up uh, nationally, the firms, our firms, Opportunity Zone and uh, Tax Incentive Practice, uh, based in Tampa, and we also have Sandy Prezant, who, while he's traveling today, sits in Los Angeles and heads up the firm Structuring Practice. Uh, I would ask Jim, Sandy, please uh, jump in, either one of you, and uh, kind of give a little bit more background, and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of this stuff uh, for all of the folks who've tuned in this afternoon. No, thank you, Ryan. This is Jim Lang. Our Opportunity Zone practice, our Opportunity Fund practice, has significant um, activity now around the country. We've been working on a number of fund formations uh, from almost every size, from the biggest in the market to many captive uh, Opportunity Fund formations for high net worth individuals, family offices um, who are getting into this space. Also, plenty of sponsor, developer, uh, deals that are based around opportunity fund financing or more moreover uh, deals that are looking for opportunity fund investors or these types of investors we're going to talk about today to come to their projects. So we're seeing a lot of activity in the market. We're going to talk about what the market looks like right now a little bit. And Sandy, if you have anything to add. Uh, not, not much, folks, except my laryngitis. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I guess... Uh, since this started at the beginning of last year, you know, this was enacted as part of the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act. We have seen so much interest in this, unlike anything we've ever seen before, really. Um, it crosses all classes. It's everybody's big decision from Ma and Pa, whose, whose investment bank and brokerage house uh, is calling them to say this is a wonderful thing for you, to the biggest of the biggest, which we happen to resent represent which are on the uh the national bank platforms the high net worth platforms so and we'll be talking about that later uh, i think you should talk to your clients because the clients either have gains to invest or they have properties uh that are in need of financing or in need of a venture partner and if you just ask around your professionals i think you're going to find that there are a lot of matches that you can make between your clients. We've done that, and it's just been amazing. Uh, we have one one big fund that's out there, three tranches, talking about a billion and a half dollars. 
And that is, uh, we've introduced them to our clients. They've already done six deals with other clients. Conflict of interest, that's another question, you know. Yes, thank you for joining us again today. Um, so where are we now? When Where did this program come from? Sandy just mentioned Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of end of 2017, the big tax bill. This was a, a relatively late amendment to the bill. The um, This was a Senate amendment by Tim Scott, and this was one of his asks in the legislation. It didn't receive very much fanfare at first, and as we're going to discuss, it, we, we had to uh, stand for mountaintops back at that point and try and convince our clients, our friends, uh, to pay attention to this. This could, if rolled out correctly, be one of the more important tax incentives of the last 30 years. It certainly has um, received attention now. So where were its origins? You can go back to 1980s and look at Jack Kemp's uh, proposals around enterprise zone programs at that time and how do we move private capital into targeted areas in the country without using government dollars. Um, those programs didn't come about, but there were some European models that were uh, based upon it and successfully based upon it. And then about three or four years ago, a group called the Economic Innovation Group started uh, advocating for this program. The group is made up of, uh, largely from Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, uh, venture capital, and private equity investors. Uh, Sean Parker is the chairman of that group of Facebook and Napster fans. There was standalone, they got standalone legislation introduced on a bipartisan basis between Cory Booker and Tim Scott um, back in spring of 2017. And uh, that is what formed the bones of what eventually got enacted in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The whole purpose of the program, again, is to move private capital, capital gains, which are estimated between six and ten trillion dollars in the marketplace, off the sidelines and into communities that are seen as. Uh, communities ripe for revitalization are already going through revitalization, and this is the engine to fuel that revitalization efforts in uh, many of our communities, both rural and urban. Application of the program has been um, has been varied across the country. We're seeing much activity in major metropolitan markets, and we're now starting to see it percolate out into many of our mid-major markets across the country. Uh, we certainly have seen price adjusting in major markets. The five boroughs of New York, uh, Hollywood and Los Angeles, Miami, or much of South Florida um, have seen price adjustments in the zones that were uh, designated as qualified opportunity zones. So how were they designated? Each governor in spring of last year, before much of the country was paying attention to the program, got to designate these zones out of areas that were eligible for other tax incentives programs, notably the New Markets Tax Credits Program. They could designate up to 25% of their eligible census tracts and submit those to the Treasury Department. Every state did that, every territory did that, and those tracts were then certified um, almost carte blanche by the, uh, by the Treasury Department across the country, and we ended up with 8,700 plus census tracts that are now active. Some of those census tracts were already attracting uh, major investment. Some, and I'd call these the middle group, are this incentive is going to be greatly important to move them into a redevelopment phase and revitalization stage. And then the third group are still a group that needs other public subsidies to make um, uh, ec economic activity make sense in those communities. Jim, would you, would you, would you, quick question. So you just broke it down into three groups, and we've talked about this before. Um, for the for the the areas that we're already focused on, that's you know this is a wonderful accretive thing, and the ones that need more incentives, maybe those will come along, but the ones that, that this is almost like a tipping point for, is is that where you're seeing uh, as the head of the, the firm's practice, a, a lot of most of the focus, in terms of business deals as well as development deals, because of the the tipping point well, nature of this. We're seeing that as the most potential deals in those gotcha. areas. Where we're actually seeing the most deals that got done very quickly out the door were in the areas that were those deals were those deals were already either planned or they could have gone they could have gone ahead. This was the extra push to make it viable, but they gotcha. were already in the, those top level areas. We're going to start and we're starting to see that percolate out into that middle group where this is very important to, to see activity. I just want to give the, the folks an, an idea as to whether or not there was any concentration in, in group A, B, or C. But I, I interrupted you. Please please continue. 
No, of course. This actually, I think, answers the next uh, item. I answers a question we've already gotten across um, about 1031 investing, and is this somewhat like that? It is and it isn't. So we'll walk through what the process is for investing in qualified opportunity funds. This program is, is based on capital gain. That capital gain doesn't have to be from a real estate sale. That can be from a capital gain of your sale of equities from stock and Facebook and, and Google. It can be from the sale of artwork, a sale of a company, or sale of real estate, sale of anything that creates capital gains. And uh, of course, in a 1031 exchange, you roll out of one asset, then you take your full proceeds and you roll into another asset within 180 days. You have to go through an intermediary and you have to identify that asset and it has to be like-kind property. The Qualified Opportunity Fund program is uh, geographically uh, located, so whether you can roll out of a real estate asset and roll into a business, or you could roll out of a business and into a real estate asset, but it's geographically contained within the requirements of the program. Qualified or even, or even, even, Jim, you could roll out of your wine collection and into Qualified Opportunity Zone deals. Right. Right. Yeah. Anything that creates a capital gain and you roll into uh, one of these transactions, you have much more flexibility in what you can do in these deals. In the 1031, of course, there's limits on what you can do in terms of structuring in your tick structures or what you're going to do with your partners. Here, there are many joint venture type of arrangements that you would normally see in any type of whether real estate or operating business um, structure. Probably most importantly here, particularly for early stage 1031 investors, in this case, unlike a 1031, you only have to roll your gain portion of a deal in off a of sale. You don't have to roll your basis. So that basis becomes after-tax liquidity to an investor, whereas in a 1031 exchange, you're rolling the entire corpus over into the next deal. In 2026, a tax is paid, and we'll talk about that in a moment. In this program, in the Qualified Opportunity Zone program, we're in a 1031 exchange world. Oftentimes, investors plan to keep rolling into 1031s and never pay a tax at the end of the day, go to the great basis, step up in the sky. Um, now, with new proposed regulations, we do have some estate planning um, mechanisms that we can work with in the Qualified Opportunity Fund world, too, for investors, um, which are important vis-a-vis -vis those two benefits. Um, also, in the Qualified Opportunity Fund, or in the 1031 world, oftentimes investors start to make bad deals because they are rolling between one 1031 and the other, and they've got mm -hmm. some tight time windows. In this case, you get a little bit more flexibility on that, because you might be holding this one asset, and then after 10 years, rolling out. So those are a few comparisons. Going on to, going on to updates, and then I'm going to, uh, then we're going to get into the meat of, after another polling question, we're going to get into the meat of um, an example and, and what we're doing in this space. But there's four, I think, important points in this in this program at this point. One is the legislation passing at the end of 2017, when very few people were paying attention to it. And then mid-summer of last year, people started paying attention, it started catching on like wildfire across the country. Come October, the first set of proposed regulations providing us some clarity, particularly in the real estate space, um, were released. And a frenzy started in the market after that release in October of last year. Then come late November, December, the president started taking personal interest in the program, and the White House did as well. And they formed, a, through an executive order, the White House Council for Economic, I'm sorry, for Qualified Opportunity Zones and uh, Revitalization. That's a 13, staffed by cabinet members, that's a 13 member committee chaired by mm -hmm. Dr. Carson. That committee is tasked with looking at every federal program, every federal agency, every federal incentive, every federal tax credit, anything the federal government touches to, uh, to motivate those programs towards investment in qualified opportunity zones. They've already identified over 800 potential applications. What that means is we're probably looking at every tax credit program, every grant in the future will have opportunity zones as a scoring criteria. Environmental regulations could be waived or uh, lessened in opportunity zone scenarios. Uh, banks, banking regulations or expansion of CRA credits for banks uh, are certainly possible to encourage lending into these opportunity zone deals. Applications across the entire federal government are now encouraged and we should see that um, start to roll out. Hand in hand with that, we've gotten we there's legislation proposed that has popular support to uh, 
for disaster relief in the future, that whenever an area is declared a major disaster area under FEMA, that area mm. will all be opportunity zones. And we've already seen special legislation for that in Puerto Rico, where 98 percent of the island is an opportunity zone now. And finally, um, April, so just a few weeks ago, April 17th, the new proposed regulations came out. A great, they provide more clarity. While we still have some open questions, we'll go over, we provide more clarity around the program. And moreover, they, uh, um, I think the theme of those regulations were operating business regulations. So they provided some guidance as to, so operating businesses could start doing what real estate had been doing since October. And investment in operating businesses can start, and there was more clarification around it. So now we're starting to see a second wave of frenzy in the market. From a tax benefit, high level, and then we can kind of go into some examples and, and get more current. Do you want to walk the group here through the, 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 the three tiers, basis, step up, and what have you? Of course. So the, so the most important four benefits of the program, why everybody's paying attention, the first three, the first three, while very important, most investors, not what's driving their um, consideration. The fourth one is. So first, when you invest in a qualified opportunity fund, you receive immediate deferral of your capital gain. Deferral has has high value in and of itself, as many investors know and as many practitioners know. Um, the ability to defer your taxation has high value. The whole purpose of the program deferred is to provide. when deferred to you know, deferred to when? How long do you get to defer your your gain? You get to defer until the earlier of your sale or exchange, or until or until 2026, December 31 of 2026. Uh, so 2026 is key. Okay, they'll have a they'll have a tax liability then. Okay, go ahead. There will Keep be. Going. Yeah. So that deferral is until 2026 or the prior sale. Um, and the whole purpose of the program is long-term investment in these targeted communities. So in year five, a 10 percent step up in basis is provided to the investor on that investment. So when they make the investment in the fund, they're given zero basis because it is a deferred gain going in. In year five, they get a 10% step up. If they hold for seven years, they get an additional 5% step up. But that's where Sandy had just mentioned that after December 31 of 2019, it phases out that, that uh, seven-year step up because there's not seven years to get to 2026. Similarly, after December 31 of 2021, you phase out the 10% step up because you don't have five years to get to 2026. Okay. Then those are the first three benefits and deferral, 5% step up, 10% step up. The great benefit of the program, we'll walk through a quick example, is the full basis step up to fair market value upon the disposition of the interest in the Qualified Opportunity Fund. And so no additional taxation on your appreciation if you hold for over 10 years. Um, that's terribly powerful in high appreciation assets, high appreciation companies. It makes clear why venture capital and private equity pushed for this program, because while you see fantastic uh, multiples in real estate, in the, in the private equity world, you can see multiples of hundreds plus on transactions, and high appreciation drives the power of this program. A few ancillary considerations here, and we'll talk um, uh, a little bit probably more about depreciation and depreciation recapture, but um, given the latest set of proposed regulations, there can be, one, depreciation can be taken during the 10-year period to the extent that investors have basis, and so they get basis either through their step-ups or through debt on the project. And that depreciation recapture after 10 years could have favorable treatment if the exit from this uh, from these funds is done in a, in a proper way and Treasury doesn't come back and change what they just provided for in these latest proposed regulations when an investor sells their interest in a partnership. Also, state tax treatment. States are treating this differently. Um, really, whether states are are conforming to the federal legislation or not conforming, about a split on states that have capital gains tax. The state of New York is coupled. Um, so capital gains in New York will be treated like they are for the federal purposes of this program. And in California, it's not coupled, but there's legislation pending, limited legislation that if you do, I think, renewable energy projects or affordable housing, that you would be coupled. And that has strong support in the state right now. Jim, the governor's Jim, budget, is it, so. <clears throat> Jim, Jim, quick question for just uh, the, the scope of that legislation. Is it just affordable housing or is it other types of rental workforce, or is that yet to be determined? I assume it's not like high-end luxury condos, but 
if, is it is it just affordable for now? That that's being yep. debated, by the way, in the in the California legislature. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you, Sandy. Right. I think I think the point there that's getting debated is whether it includes workforce up to the hundred and twenty percent. That's correct. Or whether it's, Got it. Or whether it's, right. or whether it's true affordable. And that and that not not to not to belabor the point, but that that I guess the argument there, Jim, is that affordable and workforce both seem to fit squarely within the social components and benefits uh, aspects of 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 this uh, qualified opportunity fund legislation. Exactly. And so why, and so why distinguish I, I say, one versus the other? I get it. All right. I, I'd say that much of the, the deals we've done at this point have been workforce housing deals. Gotcha. All right. Okay. So I'm going to walk through a very quick example using numbers, um, which lawyers hate to do and accountants probably love. And so I probably will butcher this. But let's take <laughs> let's take an example where um, where an investor sells Facebook stock for two hundred dollars. Their initial basis was 100. They have 100 dollars of gain. They take the 100 dollars of basis off the table and they do whatever they want to do with that. That's after-tax liquidity. They take the 100 dollars of gain, and again, it's very important to to um, clarify that all of the tax advantages associated with this program are associated with gains dollars, not your um, not in an investor. I can't go put my salary in, and it's not fresh capital. It's gains dollars off a of sale or exchange. So within 180 days of that sale or exchange, unless it's a partnership or unless it's a 1231 sale, which we just talked about, so within a partnership, there's some flexibility that they can either use the 180 days the partnership had from the sale or exchange, or they can use 180 days from the year end of the partnership. And for 1231, they have 180 days on or after December 31 of that year. But they, they invest within those 180 days into a qualified opportunity fund. We're going to talk a little bit in a bit about what qualified opportunity funds look like, and Sandy's going to go through that. But that qualified opportunity fund, once in, and once it's in a good fund, is tested semi-annually that it's at least 90% invested in good property, qualified opportunity zone property. And so that means three different types of investment constitutes qualified opportunity zone property. You can either be directly into the good property for the program, qualified opportunity zone business property. That's into tangible property that is good property for the program. So that's investing in a development, a multi-family development deal that checks all the boxes that we'll talk about in a minute. It also could be um, into qualified opportunity zone partnership interest or into qualified opportunity zone corporate stock. The corporate stock will be applicable in the operating business world. But most deals, both operating business and real estate, will be done into a second tier called a qualified opportunity zone partnership interest. Both the partnership interest or the co corporate stock have to be meet the requirements of being a qualified opportunity zone business. So if you're a qualified opportunity zone business, there's some tests you have to meet. One, at least 70% of your tangible property has to be qualified opportunity zone business property, so our good property for this program means it has to be acquired after December 31st, 2017, by purchase, which is important, by purchase, it can't be contributed, from an unrelated party, it has to be used in a trade or business, and it has to either be substantially improved or original used in the opportunity zone. Back in October, we got good guidance on substantial improvement. That's where you have existing, you have existing uh, improvements on land. You get to back out the value of the land, and then the value of the improvements have to be doubled over a 30-month period. So an example of investing that $100 into an existing multifamily complex, the land's worth 30 and the, and the complex is worth 70, you have to double the value of the 70. So you have to put $71 of improvements in over a 30-month period. We just received good guidance on what original use for that tangible property means, and that generally is greenfield development or new development in on unimproved land. That's a placed in service standard. So typically when a TCO or a CO is issued, that when that property is placed in service or the building or improvements are placed in service for depreciation purposes, that'll be placed in service for this program. And that will be original use property in that opportunity zone. So we have two different routes that tangible property can qualify, but at least 70% of your property has to meet all of those tests. 
And the related party test is an important one. It has to be acquired from an unrelated party. And that test is even skewed in this program to be a 2080 standard rather than the more typical tax law 5050 standard. So we have to do lots of structuring around related party. And I don't know, Sandy, if you want to to touch on that Jim, for a minute. That, that almost Jim, impacts every deal. Yes, yeah, Jim, this is Ryan. I just have one question. Uh, just going back to something that you had mentioned, particularly in the workforce subsidized affordable housing world, where placed in service from, from the investor's perspective in terms of the date of place of service is a very, very important threshold. So I, I would imagine you think that you, 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 would, you would agree that using that placed in service date for complying with this program and, and parallel or, or, or tracking the same concept from a financing perspective will facilitate getting these types of um, uh, deals done that, that layer different types of subsidies and include an opportunity zone um, uh, component. I imagine that's a good thing in terms of using that, that pla the same place of service concept, place and service concept. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. As long as whatever other subsidy it's using is the placed in service standard that Treasury uses for depreciation, then we're on the right. same page. And even if it's not, it's probably a very close in time date. Got it. That's what I thought. But thanks for clarifying. Sandy, go ahead. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the related party rule. The related party rule says you have to acquire the property by purchase from an unrelated party. Okay. Also, your sale of your property that generated your gain that you're trying to roll over, that sale cannot be the related party either. Now we're all used to related parties being a 50% test. They've restricted it and made it a 20% test. So 20% test of capital or profit, um, if it's greater than that, you've now disqualified the property from being able to be purchased and used. The new regs did give us the right, however, and opened the door entirely to lease this property from a related party. So we're seeing a lot of closed situations, family offices that are doing related party leases to themselves and able to put improvements on that, uh, which improvements, if they double the improvements that are on there now, are going to uh, qualify, okay? So it's a big issue. And remember, capital or profits, right? So everybody thought, oh, terrific. I'm gonna sell my property and that's great. And I'll put in some money some rollover money myself or non-rollover money as a sponsor. And I'll go my merry way and everything will be, will be terrific. Well, once you put in a dollar and then get your 20% back end from out, your profits on the dollar plus your 20% back end from out is going to take you over the limit. And that is going to be a serious issue. Now, what we've had to do in a lot of cases where there were tiered waterfalls, where an operator's carried interest um, rat, ratchets up over time, depending on the IRR. And that ratchet gets over 20%. And then people are saying, well, yeah, but look, in total, with the catch up and the preps and the LPs, it's really not a total of over 20%. Well, it'll work for you, but you better put in a limit that says the total is not going to be over 20%. And you're going to disqualify the whole thing. Because remember, the investors expect to get these benefits. And the sponsor has agreed to, not to guarantee the benefits, but at least use commercially reasonable efforts to get them. Okay, so that's that. Okay. Um, Jim, Jim, yeah, let's let's keep going there. Yeah. So just a few other tests that the, this business will qualify. So this lower tier entity will qualify. That almost every transaction we do is the two tier structure, and. The reason for that is there's a test called non-qualified financial property. No more than 5% of your gross assets can be in, invested in or held in cash or cash equivalents. But that list is long. It includes its interest in other companies. So we can't daisy chain companies that are not over 100% owned. So we're limited to the two tiers in this structure. It also is issuance of debt. So financial services companies are hampered here to that 5% standard. Now, an exception to that standard for non-qualified financial property has always been reasonable working capital of a business. And in October, we received um, very good guidance um, as safe harbor to that reasonable working capital exception. That safe harbor provides that if you have a written plan with specificity as to budget and schedule, and you substantially comply, or your, your application is substantially consistent to that written plan, that you're given 31 months to deploy cash that's just held at the, that second 
tier level. Now in the new regulations, we that was further broadened where as to the first regulations that only applied to the, the construction, substantial rehabilitation, or the acquisition of tangible property, it now applies to startup capital and, and working capital for an operating business. It also applies now every time a new uh, amount is deposited with the lower tier entity, so you raise more money at the upper tier and you push it down to the lower tier. Every time that new push down goes to the lower tier, a new 31-month clock can start for that money as long as it's got a written plan um, applicable to it as well. So those were helpful guidance that we just received. But that 31 months is important because that gives you 31 months to develop the project. It's a spend test as to that money, but that gives you 31 months to spend the money that's been put down there and hold it in cash um, at that level or cash equivalents at that level. Now the difficulty, um, the difficulty there is if you don't do a two-tier structure, if you just invest directly out of the Qualified Opportunity Fund into a tangible property deal, into development or whatever the case may be, you're not given that 31 months. You're only given until your next testing date for that 90% test. So conceptually only six months to do a full uh, development deal or to do a full whatever you need to do to meet the test deal. Um, terribly short and that's why almost every deal you're looking at is a two-tier structure. And Jim, with, with respect to the 31 months, uh, maybe, maybe w w without going out of order, maybe this is a, a, a good time to, to kind of explain the recent guidance with the, you know, safe harbor written plan and 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 how the the the, the, the treasury regs that came out of recent really expanded, if you will, this 31 month by providing some uh, additional time periods where uh, development deals, projects, what have you, are waiting for quote unquote. I think the exact phrase is government action. If you look at on the right at, at three o'clock, you're going to see an entity numbered one, and that's your qualif that's your qualified opportunity fund. If we were to just take money and put it in number one and didn't have anything below it, that number two at six o'clock, that entity down there, which is our qualified opportunity zone business QOZB, right? If we only left it at entity one we would have to get it out by the next testing date. 90% of your assets by the next testing date, generally semi-annually, uh, have to be invested. So when we take in the money now, and, and the new regs have given us the right to ignore money for six months, but let's say we're getting ready and, and we're in number one, we need to put that money somewhere. So Jim said we do this in almost every deal, and it has been in every deal I've worked on. We created the entity at six o'clock. The, um, the qualified opportunity zone business. So what we do is we go to get the money in from our investors, number four, which are sort of like dead center under 12 o'clock, they're the little people. Um, <laughs> little people invest their money in number one, and number one says, under the operation number three, our operator, our sponsor, says, okay, I gotta get this money out, what am I gonna do with it? So they adopt this written plan for entity two down below, and they drop the money down in 10 and 2 where it's a safe harbor working capital reserve to be spent over 30 months. We have 31 months pursuant to their written plan to drop it down or to spend it out of two once we've dropped it down to entity two. Okay, so that's why that entity is so important there, that qualified opportunities on business. Now, as new, new number four investors come in, in the next closing, we take that money, we drop it down to level two, and that has a new 31 month clock. And that's what, that's what Jim was talking about. Okay. So the ability to do that and drop it down, that's one thing. The second thing is entity one, when it drops it down into entity two, if entity two qualifies, you're good. All the money's down there. Entity two has a 3070 test. So you have to take 90% of your money out of number one and drop it into number two or spend it directly in the zone. Right. And then, at level two, you've got to only put 70% into qualified opportunities on property. So if you take the 10% swing and the 30% swing, you see you only have to put 63% of your money into the zone. So that's really not been advertised in the world. I'm not sure they'd be thrilled about it. Okay, I'm going to show you one more thing on the chart here, though. Look, look how we have two ways of money coming in from our sponsor group. Top left at 11 o'clock, number eight, that's a sponsor group. The same sponsor principles of putting money into three on the right to drop it in. 
So what's happening is it's taxable money. It's going to come down and invest at the number two level, at the QOZB level. It'll join venture with the Qualified Opportunity Fund money. And then you look out to the left at like seven o'clock and you got a number six. This is very important because a lot of this money that's coming in needs a developer. And they may not be the developer, the sponsors. So they take on a number six as a developer partner in entity two. And there are all kinds of issues about a completion of construction. Can entity six, the developer, get paid some money and monetize? Answer yes. Um, and we'll deal with that later. Number six could also be a qualified fund and you could be the operator, eight, three, et cetera. Those sponsors, that's the operator and they just need more money. And then they go out and get one of these funds like you know, one of the big ones out there, Starwood or a bridge that's on one of the nat nat national platforms. And they join venture and bring in their money to number two. And that is how these are structured. So okay. so just to just to kind of clarify all that, what you what you've said, Sandy, is that is that there's many ways to put these deals together with qualified money and non-qualified money and and uh, and and a developer that's participating in the development of the project. Right. Absolutely. And people can come in at different times, Lou. So, for example, you can get your entitlement work done in number two and you're all done. And then you bring in the number six investors at a higher bit at a higher booked up value. OK, so you've got a lot more money for the inside group here. I think one thing we didn't say and I want to pass it along to you is the carried interest of the folks in number one in the qualified opportunity zone in the quad. The carried interest of number three in there, we thought was going to get the same kind of favorable treatment, and they did not give that to us. Okay, so the carried interest doesn't qualify, even though most people think it should. Carried interest doesn't qualify, so that's still going to be taxable to number three up there on the top right. Still going to be taxable. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean they can't do the deal. And, and the carried interest still is as valuable. It's just not tax exempt. Okay. And, and that's that. I'm I'm going to run through these next this final example very quickly, and so we can get into uh, the, what a qualified opportunity fund is and how it's being structured in the market right now. But the other tests that have been clarified now for a qualified opportunity zone business include the gross income test. That's the big question. That was the big test that kept a lot of operating businesses off the sideline. Where over 50% of the gross income of a qualified opportunity zone business has to be derived from the active trader business within a qualified opportunity zone. Uh, that was clarified with three safe harbors. Probably the most usable of those three safe harbors, although all three of them are very broad, much broader than we were expecting, the most usable is employee hours worked. If over 50% of the employee hours worked of a qualified opportunity zone business is in a zone, that meets that safe harbor and you only have to meet one of the three safe harbors. That is uh, that seems very generous for um, many businesses, including real estate businesses, where uh, it's not a C-suite or a compensation type of a of a test. So your compensation might be out of zone, where your hours worked are in zone. Yeah. So so that was a very important test. The other test that was um, and moreover, if you don't meet any of those three uh, safe harbors, there's a facts and circumstances where you still could qualify as a business. So that's applicable to both real estate and operating businesses, but more so to operating businesses. The intangible property test was clarified that over 40% of the intangible property of a qualified opportunity zone business has to be used in the active trader business within a qualified opportunity zone. Um, we've already talked about the 31 month safe harbor that was uh, favorable for operating businesses. It expanded the tangible property test to also operating businesses. Um, and we also got very favorable tenant lease treatment where now uh, an operating business that's under a lease doesn't have to substantially improve or have original use under that lease. Um, that lease would not be counted towards any of their tangible property tests or would not be counted as, as a negative if they did not substantially improve. That means they can be a tenant in an office building and they're not going to be held to the substantial improvement or original use test as to that lease. Um, very important for operating businesses as that was a point of uncertainty. Um, so going back to the example to close out and then. All right, Jim, let's let's go through that last example and then uh, I'm sure there'll be a couple trailing questions and we'll we'll leave a few minutes for Lou to see who in the audience has uh, emailed him questions and, and he can pick which ones to uh, 
No, perfect. So, so now, now we got our money in the hundred dollars. It's gone through that whole qualification process we just did. The hundred dollars is immediately deferred. If you liquidated in year four, you're going to pay capital gains tax on year four rather than you did on day one. Uh, whole purpose was again uh, this long-term investment. So in year five, if you liquidate, you'd be uh, paying capital gains tax on the ninety dollars rather than the hundred dollars today, plus any interim appreciation. If you liquidate in year seven. You'd be paying capital gains tax on $85 because of the 5% step up instead of the $100 today plus any interim gain. In 2026, the tax does get paid. That's the lesser of the initial deferral less the step up in basis or the fair market value of that opportunity fund interest. And that's important for valuation purposes. Um, value uh, Appraisers might become very um, uh, popular in 2026. But that's also less than fifteen percent. So if you're if you made a bad deal and your hundred dollars has gone to fifty, you're not going to get penalized. It'll be fifty dollars less the fifteen percent step up in basis, assuming you held long enough, and you'd be paying tax on thirty five dollars rather than the hundred dollars today. Um, so in twenty twenty six, in twenty twenty six, where am I going to get the cash to pay the tax? The new regs finally gave us a rule that made it clear that we can borrow to make that distribution provided the borrowing is in the basis of the of the investor. And under the 752 rules, we'll get in basis or on our basis when we make that distribution. So you're allowed to do that, but remember it's gonna probably be the appreciation in the value that you're gonna be be distributing. And uh, query whether 2026, will you be able to refinance to make the distribution? We say to investors, if circumstances warrant, and the GP determines. So that's limited, how we get the cash. Li- limited to the to the investor's basis in the property in terms of refinance. Cor- correct, and that would be basis generated by the debt because right. you're not going to have basis in the property once you roll over your gain into the into the investment. Which, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the concept, I'm sure it's not new to the folks on the phone, but the concept of, you know, periodic and, and timely refinances to capture some of the appreciation is a is a cornerstone of, 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 of real estate development and ownership around the country. So this this treatment, Sandy, I, I know that you and, and, and Jim and we, you know, advocated for this. This, in your mind, is, is, is a big home run that came out a few weeks ago. A huge, huge home run that you're, that you're able to borrow out and do this. Not only can we borrow out now, but when the project's complete, we can refinance out our developer if we needed to. So this is, this is good. And, right. And so what that does is, one, it impacts IRRs, and two, it allows, because now you can get cash out earlier, and two, mm-hmm. it helps that 2026 liquidity event. There was a two-year anti-abuse rule that was put in, and really all that did was tie to the existing disguised sale rules and make the cash applicable to disguised sale rules. So, you, right. I'm just talking about seven for those of you who know that stuff. Right. So they, you typically okay. have to wait so, two years now. After ten years, now that hundred-dollar property you sell for a thousand dollars. That nine hundred dollars of gain is, uh, if you sell your interest in the opportunity fund, is now. Uh, no, there's no further taxation on it. Question is, do we have depreciation recapture for any depreciation we took over the 10 years? And the language of the new proposed regulations never directly address depreciation recapture, but they provide some examples and they provide a treatment like 754. It happens immediately, deemed to happen immediately right before the sale, where you get a full fair market value step up in basis internally on, on ordinary income assets, including hot assets, um, which would presumably also include your depreciation step up as an outside investor. Now, if you take the new special yeah, election, so, that, um, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, and this is probably where, where you're going. Um, if you sell your interest in that QOF up top, entity one, if you sell your interest in that, you're going to do just fine because you get your basis step up and it's great. Question is down below, if you sell at the QOZB level, would you be able to get that basis step up? And all of this right now is is somewhat moot because the one provision of the regulations, the most important provision that you could sell the properties down below instead of having to sell your interest in the fund way up top there. Right. You could sell the interest in below and get the basis step up. That is not effective yet. It's not effective until final regulation. 
that's the one well, that's the, out there. Lots of these regulations can be relied on now as long as they're relied on in uh, consistently and uniformly, but that one provision so is not able. Correct. That, that so walks me Jim, before by example. So where do we go from here, Ryan? So I was going to say, uh, I, I've got by, by my clock, and I could be off a minute or two, we've got about six minutes left. And, and obviously, with respect to a lot of the, the stuff on the real estate side and, you know, government action and, and other structuring issues um, in terms of selling interest in funds versus the, you know, the, the issues that you guys are faced with, Sandy, with multi-asset funds and single asset funds. I was just going to ask Lou if there was any uh, if there were any questions, whether they be common or, or repetitive, that he thought we could use the last five minutes to to answer. Um, again, to the extent there are, let's let's fire away, Lou. If not, we can you know wrap up with a couple other high I know high level topics. Yeah, that's great. I so wouldn't that's... expect a lot, a lot. I wouldn't expect a lot of questions. It's so simple, right? Right. It's right. also simple. <laughs> yeah, I think right. the base, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Biggest confusion, I think, is on the depreciation recapture. We've seen a lot of questions asking, you know, for more clarification. So, can you just give an example how, how, and when depreciation recapture might come into play in a typical scenario? We've, we've rolled out of one. Uh, so, there's probably two different examples. One is I've, I've sold business assets for a 1231 gain, and I'm going to roll that in. You know, there normally would be some inherent um, recapture in that transaction and then how about also when we uh, sell qualified business uh, uh, opportunities on business assets down the road and there's recapture there what would be the impact of that to, in that example well I, Jim, I can Jim, you want to take that right. right so so on the way on the way in nothing in this new regulation changes how uh, depreciation recapture happens or or is affected on the way into the fund. Um, so when you have ordinary income depreciation recapture on the way in, that's not going to be gains that are eligible for investment oftentimes as long as it's ordinary income. Now, to the extent that it's capital gains under one of our provisions uh, or it's treated as capital gains, that would be eligible for investment. The other question, though, on the exit, because that's that's where we really have spent most of our time and that's what the proposed regulations were, were focusing on, is in the proposed regulations, if you sell your interest in the fund, that's where you get the deemed internal step up in basis prior to that sale um, if you've held for over 10 years, if you sell your fund interest. Now, if you sell, if there's a new special election in these proposed regulations, the special election provides that um, any that the qualified opportunity fund can sell qualified opportunities on property. So one of those three things that it holds, either direct property, the partnership interest, or the corporate stock, it can sell any of those three. And any gain that passes through on a K-1 to the investor, as long as they've held the interest for over 10 years, can be excluded from income. And you have a corresponding step up in basis. And so it provides those specifically that it's only capital gains that pass through on a K-1. So in that scenario, that would not exclude your ordinary income on depreciation recapture on the special election if the investor uses the special election. So it's two, it's two different treatments. If you sell your interest in the fund, you might have depreciation. You might not have any depreciation recapture based on the language. And if you use the special election that uh, was was – um, created in these new proposed regulations, you very well could have uh, depreciation recapture. That's the dichotomy between the two treatments, and we're wondering, is that going to be brought into a unified treatment one way or the other? That's yeah, the special election that's not yet effective, right? That's great. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, so the other question that I saw that I, I have a particular interest in, in on the, you know, when we're comparing this to a 1031 transaction, Obviously, if if I've rolled from one property to another in a 1031 transaction on um, upon my death, uh, my family will get a step up in basis and all that gain is gone. I think it's a little bit different with respect to uh, ozone uh, investments in that the initial initial gain would not be excluded from some of the state, right? The the, the step up in basis on on right. the, the investment itself, but not the. So, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Right. So, so there's now there's estate planning strategies all around this, and I'm not going to get into those today. Um, and in fact, we'd have to have a whole different webinar on that. 
on how we can possibly exclude it both ways. But under the under the plain language of the law, the beneficiary is going to receive it'll, it'll be income in respect of the decedent, but they'll receive the same clocks that the um, that the uh, decedent did have, and so they'll pay the tax in 2026. Um, assuming that there's no planning around that, and then post 10 years, they'll get the full fair market value step up in basis. That's what we received out of these new proposed regulations. It would not be an include. Well, I, I guess the important point about that is death would not be an inclusion event to the beneficiary, where they would have to immediately realize that deferred tax. 